Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, I'm here with Michael, and I believe those are the two people who are going to enjoy today's show. Yeah, the two of us for the two features. You know, people love the Tarantino and Rodriguez, uh-huh. even if they don't know they do. And uh, it's, <laughs> been, that's true. <laughs> it's been a good, what, 30 weeks since we did the last one, so I, I feel know. like it's about that time. I again. watch them all the time, I'm not sh- I don't remember when the time I last watched them for the show was. Uh, what are the, the features we're doing today? Uh, yeah, yeah, so I guess that was the last time was the ones we're doing today, which yeah. is Pulp Fiction and Sin City. Yeah, this was one of those where we, because that's nine hours of movies, yeah. we did that earlier in the week mm. to do today's show. Uh, so you have just ran up a flight of stairs yes. at this point. Yeah, flight of stairs and multiple blocks. Now, usually when you get to the studio, we sit down, kind of get the drinks situated, uh-huh. do whatever. But today I was here sitting in the chair with yeah. the microphone hot, just well, waiting for you to, to jump right in. Yeah, so, I, it'll be better when weather permits a little bit more, I think. So part of the reason for that is that these are two movies that I'm just ready to talk to uh, to anyone about at yeah. pretty much any time. And I guess, as we discussed before, we have to do the Tarantino first. Uh-huh. Uh, right. That's just that's just how these things operate. We are going to spoil both of the movies. Uh, you may not have seen Sin City. In my mind, just as many people saw Sin City as Pulp Fiction, yeah. but that's clearly not the case. In my mind, the people that saw Sin City don't know they saw Sin City. Yeah? Is yeah. that what happened? If you don't remember it, don't say you hate it. Yeah. Also, don't listen to the show. Well, maybe listen to the show. If we can't convince you right now to watch Sin City again before you listen to the show, then uh, that's just not going to happen. But if you do want to watch it again, you can listen to the Tarantino portion and then skip over to the credits. Or for Grindhouse fans, you could skip the Tarantino portion and go to the Rodriguez portion. You could do that, avoiding the spoilers in the show, because we have chapters. So uh, those are in the chapters menu. If you've been listening to the show for a while, you know all about the glory of the chapters menu and something about Zunes. Pulp Fiction kind of reminds me of when we were talking about The Shining. Okay. It's one oh of those God. movies. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I'm going to explain to you that. Uh, give me a second here. All right, so, I mean, the original inspiration for this thing, we saw a long time ago, I remember, I'm not as familiar with the Tarantino interviews from back then as uh-huh. I am for things like Inglorious Bastards, but if you're a fan of Tarantino movies, you've got to watch the interviews, because the man is just as much of a character, maybe more so, yeah. than the people totally. uh, in his film. And we'll get to Tarantino as an actor, as well as a character, yes, because that will. is heavily on display, uh, something we didn't cover nearly enough in Desperado. We'll get to cover plenty here. Do um, you remember the Mario Bravo movie, Black Sabbath? Because I don't, I, yeah, but it roughly. was, I, I believe it was at three in the morning at the uh, music I'm box. I'm pretty sure that it was, yeah, three or four a.m. So that was one of the original inspirations for Pulp Fiction and a lot of the nonlinear storytelling that I don't do, you know, it wasn't really nonlinear in uh, Black Sabbath, but it was kind right. of, it was three different stories. Sure. So that was chapter uh, style storytelling. Right, right. And, you know, especially in the early stuff, although I guess that's carried through to today, mm-hmm. Tarantino is obsessed with chapters. Yeah, that's he his loves thing. that. Title cards and chapters. Rather than taking one story and trying to drag it out over three hours, we take a lot of short, punchy stories and just give them to characters who all happen to be interacting in the same narrative so that we have a lot to do in one movie that isn't, especially with Pulp Fiction, isn't necessarily about any. I mean, how do you describe the plot of Pulp Fiction? You with characters, I guess. Yeah, people probably say the hitmen. I yeah. mean, it's about two hitmen and what they learn in their right. in their journey, I guess. But that's not even you have this whole third act about the boxer, you know. Sure. So I don't know if that's even true. Uh, and then seeing stuff that happens with Marcellus. So I'm not really sure that you could even give this a straightforward plot synopsis. But it's just about uh, the individual stories for individual characters. But in being so extremely popular, and this is getting back to The Shining. This is coming back around. Just give it a second. I'm reminded of the part in Four Rooms where Tarantino is trying to tell the story and explaining how it takes him six years, and that's just how he does it. So when we talked about The Shining, we talked about mass interpretation because The Shining was ridiculously popular. And Pulp Fiction is also one of those movies that, I mean, it's one of the five or ten top movies of 
all time on any critical list of anything ever. Probably of rightly so. Lists of um, financial successes, sure, sure. of critical Popular success, films, of uh, right. visionary success. I'm going to go ahead right now and just punch in a lowest common denominator thing. So we saw a while There's that ago. There's too, right. We saw a while ago that there was the Academy Awards, which... I don't remember if I've lambasted enough on Double Feature, but I, believe I, you have. I hate the Oscars, sure. and I think that they're just full of lowest common denominator bullshit, boring films that everybody likes because they're not making anything interesting. Right. Tarantino was one of the first people to ever breach that for me when yeah. he, when Inglorious Bastards got nominated. Sure. Right? sure. And that's I think what Pulp I think Pulp Fiction was the beginning of that was the beginning of mass appeal of something really interesting, you know, in film. Well, because of those layers, because it's doing. I don't even necessarily know if I would say it's layered. When we looked at something like Fight Club, yep. it had lowest common denominator dudes punching each other. And then <laughs> right. it also had some other... Well, kind man of, tits, also LCD. <laughs> man tits, right. Uh, and then it had some extremely heavy... I say heavy now after you said man tits. So heavy man tits. The, but that was a layered approach because you had fighting on top and underneath that was some darker stuff. We covered all that in the show. I don't know if there's necessarily anything underneath the stuff that the uh, the masses like yeah, about well, Pulp Fiction. I think it's just done so extremely well. You know what I think it is, and, and maybe we're a little jaded, and that's why we never really call it out. I think it's background. I yeah. think, and, and I don't mean like backdrop for the film, because mm -hmm. I don't understand backdrop or symbolism or anything like that. But what I do understand, and oh, do we both understand it, is that Quentin Tarantino does exploitation stuff. Yeah, It's right. all based on exploitation, and maybe the reason that we dig it so much, maybe the, the extra layer that we don't really realize is there, is all the callback stuff. Sure, all right. The, all right. the, you know, callback to black exploitation and hangout films, and even there's a little bit of road exploitation here and there. Yeah, right. Pegged in there. Well, and it's a crime of, drama. It's sure, no right. I mean, well, those the are the ones stuff, that, right? It's yeah. the pulp yeah, stuff. Yeah, right. Stuff that hasn't been around in a while and that people didn't realize they actually loved. Sure. Crime was really big in Tarantino's early stuff, and we'll get to more pulp noir kind of stuff when we talk about Sin City. But that's something that apparently didn't work as well for right. Sin City, to pull back from that old stuff. I think that's, you know, and once again, to bring this back to the point I was making about The Shining, is that this is also one of the most overanalyzed films. Yes. It's one of these films that, uh, and I mean in the wrong directions. You know, people talk about how um, I, I was just reading an essay about how the characters wear armor in the movie, how all of their all of the costumes are armor, which goes back to one of those Melville things, the French director. And that's something that Tarantino was looking at and going, oh, I like what he did here. I'll put in my movie. But I don't think Tarantino ever sat down and said, what is Butch's armor for this film? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or like the bathroom stuff. So right. much of this movie takes place in the bathroom. Maybe that was actually written in there, but I feel like, and if you listen to these interviews with Tarantino, that's how he defends the trunk shot, right? He says, sure. where would you put the camera? It's not necessarily a staple of his movie. He doesn't view it like that. I need to put a trunk shot in there. They just accidentally fall into every single sure. movie like they do in Pulp Fiction. I think it's the same with the bathroom. All of these characters, I mean, they're all shady characters, so they all need somewhere secluded to do their shady business. Right. And um, with Vince's character, it's all of the shady stuff that's happening when he's in the bathroom outside of the bathroom. You know, it's Butch coming back and he's, you know, he's basically sent there to kill Butch. Right. And then up. Butch finds the snake Plissken gun on the counter. <laughs> right. And or the away. one at the end where that whole robbery is happening while Vince is in the bathroom. And then there's Mia Wallace, you know, in the bathroom snorting the coke or whatever. They have the heroin, I guess. It's ha well, no, it's coke in the first. She does the, the heroin is what knocks right, her out. It's right, cocaine you know, later when sure. she said, "God damn." Sure. Uh, well, while Vince is in the bathroom psyching himself up in that scene, right? So I feel like it's just a way to get the characters. You know, I don't want to read into that stuff too much. The one thing that this did in the '90s is spawn. I mean, I guess it did a lot of things, but it spawned this nonlinear storytelling that appeared everywhere so uh, i still don't really know you know I, I wish i had here is the exact use for this and it accomplishes a lot of things but i mean give me your take on the nonlinear storytelling the nonlinear storytelling i think in pulp fiction is really good for one rewatchability mm -hmm. i mean if you go more than what four months without watching pulp fiction you've forgotten half the movie right and in a good way, you remember, you remember kind of, you remember that Marcellus Wallace gets his ass fucked. Right. You remember 
the syringe in the chest. You remember everything that the hitmen do. You remember the scenes, but maybe not the content right. of the scenes. You go, I, oh, that scene where this happens, where this happens. This is real nonlinear storytelling, though. Not the type that people force on his other movies. And I think, I want to call us out on that, just back in Reservoir Dogs. We talked about it as if there was nonlinear storytelling. If this weren't, a, you know, if Reservoir Dogs wasn't a Tarantino movie, no one would ever say that. Uh, some of these other Tarantino movies like Jackie Brown, um, stuff that happens in Kill Bill, no one would say it's nonlinear story. To, maybe Kill Bill, some of the stuff is out of place. But it would seem straightforward, and occasionally you have a flashback. Yeah, I guess and it's no flashbacks one, versus yeah, No non-linear. one throws their arms up and says, nonlinear storytelling, but people think that's a Tarantino thing. So right. they point it out in well, movies maybe, like Well, maybe, I don't Dogs. know, in Re- Reservoir Dogs came out a while ago when, when flashbacks had to be hazy yeah. or in soft <laughs> focus There's no or soft some focus, shit. so it's not So maybe that one, I could, I could say, You'll gets a pass that. as potential nonlinear storytelling. But everything else, I'll say that's our own fault. This one is cut up again in something that we would see in Sin City, even you know with the, the original comic books, where you have stories that are happening at the same time. Right. So you're learning uh, different components of specifically, you know, the opening diner scene and the last diner scene. You don't even realize you're in the same diner. Maybe you do if you're really paying attention. When the, I always forget that when that last scene comes yeah. up. It's only when Tim Roth is ordering coffee that I go, right. oh, yes, once again, it's, you know, it's from the beginning of the movie. But even that mechanism is used so well. We have a fucking term for it. You know, that could be Flying Tom Tom or Bookends or a combination of both just that we're revisiting that opening scene. But the rest of the narrative is cut up too. I mean, you start following Jules and Vincent, and telling their story requires looking at different parts of the chronology. So I think, you know, we we see everything that happens with Big Kahuna Burger and all right. that bullshit. Sure. We don't know what happened with the stuff in the car till later. At that point, we're still getting our introductions. We're not ready for the part of the story that tells us there's brains all over the car. Right. We're just ready to learn that the hitmen showed up there and they killed somebody and they're badasses. And later when we see them, you know, right after that scene, we jump to them in surf clothes. Yeah. And you don't even really question it uh, because you're still learning about them. Right. Yeah, they're in different clothes. That's weird. It tells you it's a different moment in time. Exactly. But that's still the part... Different parts of the chronology, but the right parts of the story for us to be learning about the characters. Uh, we get kind of an introduction to Marcellus. Um, we find out little things about, you know, that's the scene where we learn about how Butch has a connection to sure. Marcellus. It's the only scene. Well, no, we get a second scene, but that's the scene where we see Vince and Butch. Yeah, yeah, well, right. The only scene they interact in before. And without that scene, when Vince was in the apartment how the fuck would butch have known right. that he was a hitman or sure, anything it sure. gives it gives just something something really quick like the i'm not your pal buddy i'm not your buddy <laughs> right, guy. right right that scene i don't remember the exact words so i always go back to canadians from south park but it gives the characters a depth that adds to the killing later on which just it's another again see that's another thing that i would argue is a layer to the film that most people may not pick up all right on. sure sure in that scene, we don't realize that we're learning so much about Butch because we are obsessed with Marcellus still at that point. Right. Marcellus has been built up so high. There's that whole opening dialogue about how he killed a guy for a foot massage. Sure. Even the way the camera works, we just see the camera on Butch. And the longer we stay on Butch, the more we start to wonder, well, who is the man that Butch is talking to? Remember when we did House of the Devil? Yes. You know, before you finally see that character, Mr. Mr. Ullman? Yeah, you just keep saying, well, who is he? What does he look like? What's happening there? That's how it is with Marcellus. And then when the camera finally pulls back to do that kind of um, over-the-shoulder shot, you see conversations filmed in uh, so frequently. Rather than focusing on Butch, who's doing a lot of the talking and what you would do with that over-the-shoulder shot, you're instead focusing on the foreground, the back of Marcellus Wallace's head, which is so not important, but that's where the focus is at that point, right? You're mm-hmm. saying, oh, he's got a Band-Aid, he's bald, what do we know about him? They're building him up to godlike status at sure. that point. Like there's something mysterious about him, as if you know, when we see his face, it will somehow be revealed right. that he's, he's really, yeah, he's Butch, yeah, <laughs> is, right. is the reveal that would happen in any other movie. The camera would turn around and there would be no person there. You know, the camera something would ridiculous turn around like and it'd that. be it'd be like a mirror, I guess. If we got the actual chronology of a lot of this stuff, we would have to see, you know, how Marcellus handled everything with the wolf on the phone. We would get that exposure to Marcellus too early and he wouldn't have been built up to godlike status. 
So what I'm getting at with this nonlinear storytelling is I think you have two questions. Normally in a film, the questions have to kind of come together in writing. You say, when do you show your characters? Where? And then also, how does your story play out? So in Pulp Fiction, the genius of Pulp Fiction is separating those two. So we can kind of, it's a have your cake and eat it too scenario. You have your characters completely over here, and we are going to tell the best story that fits the characters at the best moments, something we saw in Reservoir Dogs, learning about the character's background, Mm -hmm. at the moments that are right for the film, at the appropriate beats, whether or not that has to do with the chronology. We're going to do the chronology separate so we can still tell a great crime drama but we're not going to tell it in order because that wouldn't best suit the character. You know what I mean? Yes. Stuff like building up Marcellus, stuff like even look at Vincent Vega's death. I mean, you get Vincent Vega's death at the uh, kind of at this middle point in the movie. Anywhere else, you know, in any other movie, if the story were told linearly, you would have to show it at the end of the movie. But instead, you get this great thing where once Vincent dies, you're suddenly really attached to him. Oh, no, he died. But it's okay because the story's told out of order. You get to hang out with him right. again. And that has so much more of an impact. You pay so much more attention to that character because now you know he died. So every single second that you spend with him on screen, it's suddenly, well, I have to savor this because soon he's going to be gone and that's going to be it. Right. But on the flip side, that works not just for your characters, but again for your story. It lets you pick what would be, what feels like the best ending for your story. Sure even if that's not the best way for the story to actually end. You know, here in this ending, our characters learn something. That always happens at the end of every fucking story. And uh-huh. sometimes if it's if the characters learn nothing, we're not as satisfied. And if it's too heavy, then it feels really cheesy. Right. So here the characters learn something, but they learn something while they're in the diner. Sure. It's not the chronology, uh, the end of the chronology, right. but it's the end of... Pulp Fiction as a story itself of the film. Right. So we get the satisfying feeling that the movie ended where it should have and the characters learned something. Although if we think about how their actual lives played out, maybe not so much. Well, we never find out what happens to Jules. Right. Maybe he goes off and... Watch the Earth like Kane. But the film... So that's the ending of the film. But I think we need to go back to the beginning of the film. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking beginning of the film tim roth with the briefcase because the briefcase is for later in this show because this show has a non-linear format you mean a poorly designed format same thing but in the beginning beginning when the credits are rolling yes there's this song that plays there is yeah so there's this song called misery lou anybody who's ever heard this song after watching pulp fiction thinks of pulp fiction when they hear this song and anybody who's heard the song without seeing pulp fiction doesn't know they've heard the song yeah right and they wouldn't remember it once they see pulp fiction sure Tarantino has this thing where he's not he's not Robert Rodriguez, okay? He doesn't sit in front of the camera or behind the camera or editing the camera. I don't guitar. know, doing anything. Tokala yeah, exactly. guitaring. Holding his right. holding his guitar, mariachiing the film. Right. Having conversations with crew members and scoring it while they're speaking. But Quentin Tarantino has this incredibly honed talent of finding obscure music. And making it the right, theme right. to his film. <laughs> One of the world's best DJs. Quentin yeah, Tarantino. I guess. Yeah. You have Misery Lou in Pulp Fiction. I think that's easily the most well Sure, although, one. you know, uh, Girl, You'll Be a Woman. I mean, there's so many right? different pieces of music that resemble different scenes. Or that without those pieces of music, they would not be the same scenes right. at all. Right. And you're right. They're, they're absolutely things. You, you hear Girl, You'll Be a Woman, and you think especially if it's the Urge Overkill version and not the uh-huh. Neil Diamond version, right. you think Pulp Fiction. All of these songs, you hear them everywhere. Uh, if we finally fucking find a way to get Kill Bill on the show, we'll talk about that a lot. Because that was another movie where the music just started to show up because it wasn't licensed sure. specifically for the movie. There were songs written without the movie being in mind, and he just compiled them, put them in the film in the perfect places as if they were composed for right. Pulp Fiction. Exactly. They fit so well. Yeah, managing to steal that association, because now you think about Pulp Fiction whenever you hear those songs. Mm -hmm. So he's stolen the association, whatever the original association was with the songs, and now his movie is, you know, all you can think about. And I think that's probably the best thing you can say about that. So we talked about the Hitman. We talked about Butch. We talked about Marcellus a bit. Um, Can we talk about Jimmy and the Bonnie situation? Yeah, okay, let's talk about the Bonnie situation. So I meant to talk about this in uh, Reservoir Dogs, but we never got around to it. And there's a bunch of shit I meant to talk about in here, but our show is not three hours long. Mm-hmm. What's going on with racism, Tarantino movies? What People uh, are going to watch these movies, especially in the mid-90s. 
the height of the PC era, the right. politically correct uh, nonsense in film, especially. Uh-huh. And uh, Nigger appears all over this yeah. movie. So Even okay. now, as I say that, millions of listeners are turning off Whatever. their Zunes. Fuck you. So the big question is, is Quentin Tarantino a blatant racist? No. Okay, so why is that? Defend that position. All right, so a while ago in film, a while ago on the show, we did a film called Black Dynamite. Ah, and on Black Dynamite, we talked about how a while ago in film, there was this stuff called black exploitation. Sure. Was it racist? Not the question here. <laughs> the Nor question... do we know the answer. Yeah, right, right. However, the question is, is emulating black exploitation racist? Uh, that would definitely be a no. That's right. a big fucking no. Eric is not a racist, and I am not a racist. We love black exploitation. We love black people. They're great. And Quentin Tarantino, he digs black exploitation. He loves black culture. Right. So what's wrong if he wants to take black culture and Tarantino it? Right. And put it in his film. Do you think all white people talk like Quentin Tarantino? Do you think all white people talk like the Vega Brothers? A yeah. really good example of quintessential white folk sure. in Tarantino films. You know, if you want to talk about racism in Tarantino films, um, there's certainly elements of racism to the characters. Sure. Whether it's well, characters or are passive. racist. That's fine. Yeah, I but mean, I mean, it's all the white characters who are racist. You know, if you want to try and label the movies themselves as being racist, look at the fucking character in this movie. It's played by Quentin Tarantino, and it is this guy who's talking about dead nigger storage. I mean, that's his whole bit there, and he hangs on that for that entire scene. That's a commentary on the time and place that a lot of these characters are brought up and the mm-hmm. mentality of the characters. And I think that's also about how narrow-minded some of them sure. are. And then other parts of it are what a movie like Jackie Brown probably tells you more about. Where Tarantino, you know, what is it, Friday, that's on his list of top? Yeah, Friday. Because he views that, and that explains to you exactly what's going on here. He views Friday as modern-day blaxploitation, Uh, and he loves that. I went through and I watched all 13 of the best 13 films to come out in his 13 years of directing. Friday, okay, so Friday was a weird experience because... If I hadn't watched it on Quentin Tarantino's recommendation, I would have turned it off within 15 sure. minutes. All right. But watching it through the mind of Quentin Tarantino, knowing what he thought about it, that's a great film. It's painfully <laughs> good. I mean, we probably never do it on Double Feature. Fingers don't, crossed. Don't worry about that. But it's just amazing to watch something that would totally not be something I would be interested sure, in. Sure, sure. That right there tells me he's not a racist. Sure. Right? Is it too much to say that Quentin Tarantino wishes he was black? I mean, do you get that feeling? Because sometimes, there are, as much he, as that sounds like a stupid thing to say, there are certain moments in Pulp Fiction where I just, or or the whole thing of Jackie Brown, the entire movie, well, I, where he's making a black audience hangout sure. film. Well, I, I think he wishes he was black, just like you or I wish we had like a Gatling gun for a forearm. Sure, I mean, everybody's right. got wild fantasies that they would like to live out for maybe cinema. maybe a week excellent and without a painful transition we also have to talk about julia sweeney right probably because we won't do pat on the show no we, we could will not. we could have saved so much time by doing friday and pat nope. back to back on nope. the show but it's uh-uh. not going to happen uh who's julia sweeney julia sweeney is an ex saturday night live cast member who she was really she's really big as an atheist she's really big as is kind it's not really skepticism it's more just living out her life and making documentaries about it. Right. But um, Quentin Tarantino produced a lot of stuff. They've produced a lot of stuff together. Right. She had an atheist documentary that Quentin Tarantino produced, and it was about how she turned away from the religion she was brought up with. And, right. I mean, that's just her thing. It's her spiel. To look back at her career, there was a moment of uh, crazies yeah. a little bit after SNL. Yeah. I mean, she finds out her brother has cancer. Sure. Right. And then she finds out she has cancer uh-huh. and then kind of has this breakdown. And I think it was right after that that she did uh, God Said Ha. That was the beginning of her monologues. You know, she would do all these monologues. And it was just this really frank, honest, endearing um, talking about things like cancer in just a very open, almost lighthearted format, very conversational. It just felt like you were breaking down a taboo or something. Uh Like this is a dark thing people don't talk about, but we're just kind of going to make light of it. And then other people will know, you know, that that's okay. And would later go on to do Letting Go of God, which Mm. Dawkins talks about a ton uh, in The God Delusion, something that we covered earlier on the show. He talks about that in the book, the book form of The God Delusion, not the documentary. 
And that's the same sort of thing. It's coming out as an atheist and then in a light way that makes everyone feel as if that's okay. Oh, which Almost, it is. It's totally fine. Yeah, yeah, right. But that's part of it. And I won't talk about it a lot because we've discussed it in those documentaries. Uh, this feeling earlier in the decade when new atheism happened, and or I guess earlier in the last decade, is that mm-hmm. how that works? Uh, when new atheism was happening and people were coming out as atheists as if that was a scary thing to do, Back in those days, very terrifying. Today, Mm -hmm. super cool, no problems, right? And when she did the monologue and the recordings came out and everything, it was just sort of this, hey, there's other people out there, and Julia Sweeney's doing it. It's absolutely cool. She went uh, on tour doing the Jill and Julia show, which is like a music monologue kind of thing. Um, Lives in Chicago, I think one of the suburbs now, so still does a ton of stuff around here. I know records some weird stuff with NPR downtown uh, every so often. Just an awesome person, and I don't think we'll ever get another chance to talk no, about Julia Sweeney. No, we definitely won't. But so if you don't know who Julia Sweeney is in the film, she's the one that ends up going to lunch with the wolf. Sure, yes. And we don't really know what to say about the wolf other amazing. than Harvey Keitel is amazing as the wolf. It's a performance that totally speaks for itself. Yeah. And Nothing you, needs you to can't, be said you, about I the mean, wolf. Just watch the fucking movie. We learn about the wolf through conversations. That's how we learn about most of the characters. Uh, well, that's it's Tarantino, a, right? It's another part of the mystique, though, whereas I watch Pulp Fiction, even after doing a, you know some analysis of, what, 130 movies or something at this point. Really? I still, yeah. Well, no, it's twice that, I guess, yeah. because double the feature, right? Double the fun. So let's say, I don't know, 300, 400 movies. I can still go back, watch Pulp Fiction, having done all these shows, and not understand why it is. I mean, you learn about all of these characters through conversations, but what makes the conversation so good? I mean, what is it about them? You know, the conversation about foot massage. Sure. I have never been so interested in foot massages in my life. Right. But I hang on every word of that. Part of it is the technique we talked about on the Reservoir Dog show of leaving the camera lingering at the door. Uh-huh. Pressing matters here inside this room, but we have to keep talking about foot massages. But I don't know. What, it, what is it about this dialogue? I think a lot of it is because the dialogue is all nuanced stuff. It's... Mm-hmm. You learn more, you garner more about the characters and their feelings toward things, not by having them talk about other characters and their feelings toward things, but instead, you know, whether... Hypotheticals? Exactly. What would you do in the case of a foot massage? What does that mean to you? Exactly. Or whether they like dogs. All right, sure. I see what you're saying. It's easy to fucking know who doesn't like who, especially in a Tarantino film, because everybody's got a mouth on them. Yeah. But what's really difficult to kind of understand is the depth of the character, their background, their feelings on stuff other than the task at hand, how they feel about things when they're not ass raping Ving Rhames. Right. Stuff like that doesn't ever come up in a normal, you know, Ving Rhames is a bitch conversation. Yeah, sure. Yeah, even thinking about those characters, I mean, the, the pawn shop owner and whatever, you don't end the fucking gimp. Those are also characters that they don't say a whole lot in the movie. And by contrast, you kind of think, I want to know about those characters' Mm -hmm. background. I wish they had more time to talk about whatever, because they're talking about what's happening in the moment, and in doing that, you don't learn a whole lot about who they are. Whereas things like the foot massage or Amsterdam, things that are, like we talked about, chronology stuff, in the beginning of the movie, Mm -hmm. tells you a lot about the characters when you're trying to learn stuff about the characters, and you're trying to figure out what kind of situation is this, trying to figure out who the fuck is Marcellus. If you just saw Marcellus in the Butch story, you would think you already knew everything about him. A conversation like that might not be as interesting to right. you. The other thing I really like about the dialogue is that you know people say all the time that Tarantino steals from other genres. Uh, that question of are they homages or is it just ripping off other scenes? We'll get to that with the briefcase in a second. But he's taking these characters that are straight out of old movies. Mm -hmm. But the thing that he excels at, the thing that makes his movies just a blast to watch, Pulp Fiction in this example, is that you have old, the the boxer thing, or the the man taking out the boss's wife. Right, like taking her out on a date, not taking her out. Right, not taking her out. These are um, almost cliches of film noir, stories that have been told over and over. But those stories were told in 50s noir land. He is taking those noir characters here and putting them in a modern day setting. Right. We're very modern day. Well, you know, Jackrabbit Slims mm-hmm. is, it only exists because it's an old sure. gimmicky diner. Right. It's got kitsch value and something the characters even debate uh, as they, they walk in. Right. You know, should, 
that Vincent doesn't want to do that. He's sure, he just right. wants to get a steak, and, right? And whether or not uh, Steve Buscemi plays a good waiter. I did not even recognize him in that role. It was crazy. I never knew he was in this film. But you get to see what these reactions would be like of if you took somebody out of double indemnity sure. and you threw them into a modern crime film, how do those people react? Something that I don't think is done very often, especially given how often we've seen film noir redone in a modern setting. We don't get to see, you know, those are all modern characters we usually see in those movies too. We don't get to see, you know, the character of Butch is a great example because it's someone who's just, he's a bad guy. There's not a whole, there's nothing redeeming about any of the characters. That's mm-hmm. part of it being a crime movie. But we've been following the movie from the point of view of the hitman. So it's almost a challenge to see if the uh, filmmakers can make us like Butch. Right. You know, Christopher Walken tries to make us like, at least be invested in Butch's scenario. But uh, it's part of seeing how Butch, an old school character, would react in that modern set. And when thrown into a situation like the gimp suit, that's not something you're going to see in film noir. You throw Butch and Marcellus Wallace, who is, you know, the godfather, sure. right? Who is a mafia boss. Right. Does he squeal like a pig or does he take it like a man with a dick up his ass? <sighs> Spoken like a true poet there. Yeah, that's my job. So we're on three Tarantino movies now. And we have three Mexican standoffs. So that is still... And I got the feeling that that was just a post-Kill Bill situation. But we saw that in Reservoir Dogs. We saw it again in Pulp Fiction. Maybe several times in Pulp Fiction, although there's the one key scene there. And we saw that in Inglorious Bastards. Even pointed out the Mexican standoff. Something that is exclusive to Pulp Fiction is the briefcase. Yes. What's funny, and this says a lot about critical reaction to this movie, or about uh, massive mainstream reaction is that's one of the questions people ask as if it matters sure what is in the briefcase Mm -hmm. a uh, topic of many fan theories and it's totally missing the point and that's the beauty of it because that's what the briefcase is commenting on as if people it's like watching something that is satire and only taking it at face value not getting the satirical component of it i mean the briefcase is i don't know how we've done so many shows and never covered a MacGuffin, but the briefcase is something that drives the plot And an old school film guy like Tarantino absolutely knows this. I always think of the briefcase as the Maltese Falcon because I try and think that there was something good about that film that I really (laughs) like. It's an extremely notable film noir that I just so happen to not be into. And I feel terrible not being part of that club. But in the movie, they're chasing after this Maltese Falcon. It's a fucking bird statue. And part of why I didn't like the movie when I saw it is that I didn't understand that at the time. Once it's revealed that it's a fucking bird statue, I go, what's the big deal? It's a bird statue. But that's what Hitchcock called a MacGuffin. It is something the characters are chasing after that drives the plot. I've heard it in more uh, modern times called plot coupons, which I kind of actually like. But you just need something to move the plot forward. And sometimes it's an item. Even if it's not an item, it's still kind of a MacGuffin. But uh, it's just a briefcase. It doesn't matter what's in the briefcase. There's a joke about what's in the briefcase because it's glowing and isn't it beautiful and is that what I think it is. But we never find out what's in the briefcase because that's not what matters. It's a Tarantino movie. What matters is the characters. doesn't matter what's in the briefcase. And so the fact that they're chasing the briefcase just gives them something to chase so we can see their reaction to that. MacGuffin was something that I think Alfred Hitchcock coined. It was a term uh, way back in the 30s when he started talking about that in interviews and stuff. But I think it goes back to, uh, it's like a Scottish joke. Okay. It's, um, you know, these, these Scotsmen, they're on a train and one guy asks, you know, hey, what's in the, the briefcase, right? What's you know, in your luggage or whatever? And the other guy says, oh, that's the MacGuffin. And he asks, what is a MacGuffin? And the guy says, oh, it's for, you know, hunting lions in the Scottish Highlands. And so the other guy says, well, there are clearly no lions in the Scottish Highlands, to which the, the other man replies, well, I guess there's no MacGuffin there. It's this story about, ooh, lions, that's really attractive and appealing. And at the same time, oh, the MacGuffin, that is fucking nothing. It doesn't matter at all. I'm trying to talk to you about lions. So that's what the briefcase is. You're trying to talk about lions. And there are still people out there going, really, MacGuffin? That sounds really interesting. What does that smell like? Can I touch it? I want to look at it. It's also just the scene for... Have you seen Kiss Me Deadly? No. Of course not. It's a film noir from the 1950s. Why would you have seen that? I don't even know why I asked you that question. But if you've seen Kiss Me Deadly, there is... um, It's almost the same scene 
of opening a briefcase. If I remember right, it's like an atomic device or a nuclear. It doesn't matter. It's the mm-hmm. point. It's some kind of nuclear something. And uh, she opens the briefcase and the light glows up on her face. That kind of underlit. I always imagine it as orange light, even though the movie is in black and white. <laughs> and it's the same kind of scene. But when you find out it's a nuclear whatnot, I mean, I guess that's a big deal in 1950. I have no idea. But it's it's just as good when it's a glowing orange light and you just make up the shit in your head because it doesn't matter. Okay, so I'm done talking about Quentin Tarantino and glowing orange light. Let's talk about that scene in Sin City with all the glowing other colors on the people's faces. <laughs> oh, that's Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> yeah. Quentin Tarantino guest directed a scene in yeah. Sin City. So do you know the story behind that? No, this is on you. When uh, Tarantino was doing Kill Bill, the first time he ever had actual score for one of his movies, Rodriguez came in and said, oh, give me a dollar. I will do, you know, I will write the score for Kill Bill 2. It probably took him as long to watch Kill Bill 2 as to write the score because mm-hmm. that's just how Rodriguez does things. And it probably took him less time, actually. Yeah. And so this was sort of as nod, wink, repayment. Uh-huh. Quentin Tarantino would come and lend his name to the movie as he loved to do at the time with all of these Quentin Tarantino Still presents. Does. Yeah, I guess that's true. And uh, he would guest direct a scene, which happens to be the most colorful scene. And the only thing I know for sure that he brought to that scene was that Clive Owen speaks his dialogue uh, in the scene Instead out loud rather than, rather than it being, which is highly effective. It's very right? effective. If you're going to come in a movie and do one fucking scene, then I guess you did a pretty damn good yeah, job. Yeah, you did fucking good. But the rest of the movie isn't bad either. So I told you before that Sin City costs $40 million to make. Yeah, okay. Some perspective here. Iron Man 2 cost $200 million to make. Oh, my God. Sin City being a $40 million, and this is why it drives me nuts that I still don't have a Sin City 2 sitting on my, uh, I was going to say DVD shelf, but that doesn't exist. My DVD shelf. This thing made so much bank, even if only because it costs so little to make. To know that Sin City was made for $40 million, it's a joke. I mean, I wouldn't even believe, you know, base price for an action film is $50 million. A huge film like Sin City uh, one of the only films that I know for sure they shot more than they use, uh, just because Rodriguez loved the source material so much, he pretty much shot the entire comic franchise, or at least the stories that are included, and that all wound up on the recut DVDs. So if you can get your hands on that, if you love Sin City, that stuff is really cool to get the full stories. But no one really gets, I mean, Sin City does not get enough credit for being such a huge moment in cinema. I think it's one of the most notable movies we've ever covered. So many times in this conversation will the first time ever achieved in cinema pop up. I mean, just landing this movie itself. Well, yeah. I mean, okay. So let's go back to just before the film is even made. Sure. So Sin City is based on a graphic novel by, or a series of graphic novels by Frank Miller, who we covered back in 300 and we covered even more in depth when we did the spirit, even though he didn't actually do the spirit. The comic. He exactly. yeah, made the film. We learned about him as a filmmaker there, but Sin City, the comic was known for its illustrative style and its grittiness. Mm-hmm. It was all about and for shadows. the way the film and, looks. Right. <laughs> the way the film right. looks is how the graphic novel looks. Yeah, how sure. The, comics the whole thing is monochrome and later they added splashes of colors, but it's literally you take a black marker on white paper. There's no shadow in the entire thing. And uh, also the chronology stuff, I mean, to look back at the, mm. the Pulp Fiction conversation we're having. It's a bunch of stories that take place in the world of Sin City and mm-hmm. Basin City. Sure. And they all kind of take place at the same time. And occasionally one leaks over into another. So Frank Miller doesn't want to do movies. Or no. he didn't then. After he, RoboCop, he said, exactly. fuck that. So Robert Rodriguez wants to do Sin City. And Frank Miller, being the lovable guy that we all know and love. Oh, says, good old Frank Miller. Says, fuck you, I'm drunk, get out of my apartment. And not to Rodriguez, but to film in general. Exactly. People have been, especially after comics started to become a thing in movies. Sure. People were, it was one of the most sought after properties in existence and he would not give up the rights to it. So Robert Rodriguez goes down into what I would assume is his basement, but since seeing his house, it's probably one of the barns full of the 900 acres of land he owns. But let's pretend for our own sake that he goes down into his basement and, and calls up some people and essentially Marley Shelton and Josh Hartnett right. is who he calls up. And he shoots the the first scene in the film. Yeah. The customer is always right. And what he does is shoots this on his own dime, mm-hmm. which is literally a dime. Yeah. And sends it to Frank Miller goes, I'll do this whole thing. You can co-direct with me. What do you think? And Frank Miller 
gets out of the shower or whatever and finds I think the they tape. were in a bar when he pitched it. Okay. So I, he finishes so off his sense. glass sure. is what happens. Frank Miller right. finishes off whatever third or fourth drink he's been drinking since they've been there for 15 minutes. And... I like how we're just randomly painting Frank Miller as a drunk, knowing nothing about what Frank Miller does in his day-to-day activities. <laughs> that seems about right, sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, Frank Miller bites, right? Frank yeah. Miller goes, okay, wow, this is great, you're a great director. Frank Miller is us. Yeah. Frank Miller goes, wow, you're great, you did something nobody else would ever do, and I think that I would love to do this with you, and yes, fine, I'll give you the property, and we'll make ourselves a great film. And there's Frank Miller for you, nobody seemed to agree. So this is really, I mean, he is taking a huge risk here, right? I mean, partially he's not because he just really wants to make Sin City. He just thinks that'd be great. And I'm sure deep down he also knew Rodriguez comes off a little bit humble when he talks about stuff like this, but he knew this looks badass. I'm going to show this to Frank Miller and it's going to be awesome. And so he just takes the leap. He has absolutely no permission, no support, no anything. He has the Sin City comics. That mm-hmm. is all he, and Josh Hartnett for the weekend. And that's all he has. And so he goes and he green screens the whole thing. Um, the movie also extremely notable for being one of the first movies that was shot almost entirely in green screen. I think fucking Sky Captain actually beat it out into cinema, but no one even remembers that movie. So I'm just going to continue to say Sin City's the first one that did it. Certainly did it better. So that doesn't even fucking matter shoots this thing, takes it to Frank Miller with this great pitch in mind. I mean, not only did he make this awesome thing, and he gives it to Frank Miller and says, hey, if you like this, you know, if you don't want to do the movie, you can have this short I made. Won't that be awesome to show it to your friends? Or we can seriously buckle down and do this movie. And as part of that commitment, he does two things, which are awesome. Uh, one less awesome than the other. He builds the bar. Right. That's that's part of, hey, Frank, we'll build this bar. We'll build Nancy's bar. I think it's it's Katie's. Right. Yeah. And we can hang out in it and do our script writing meetings and whatever. So that was one of the very few physical sets. There's parts of the apartment for the big fat kill. And there's also a little bit of the hospital that's built. But it's, it's basically just the bar. That's mm-hmm. the only real full set. And then the other part of the commitment was I will bring you on as co-director. Now, we've seen the spirit, say whatever you will about the spirit, but this is also a very dangerous move. Robert Rodriguez, for maybe the first time in his life, is relinquishing some control over to Frank Miller, who has basically no directing experience, just to say, I want you as a director on this project. You're going to call the shots. I want to do what he would always call a translation of Sin City, not an adaptation, but a translation. And so in being a co-director of the film, the Directors Guild said, you're not allowed to, you're not a legitimate partnership right. is what they said. Like the Coen brothers, they're a legitimate partnership. Those uh, fuckers who made the Matrix movie, legitimate partnership. Rodriguez, Miller, that is not a legitimate partnership. Any other screen maker would throw their hands up and say, well, fuck it. I guess we can't do it. Boohoo the guild. Red tape got in the way. Never going to happen. What does Rodriguez do? He says, fuck you, Directors Guild. I'm out of here. He quits the fucking Directors Guild his gateway into making films and has, I think, probably had a hard time getting a lot of stuff greenlit since Mm -hmm. then. Although, you know, stuff's been picking up and quits the director's guild so that he can keep Frank Miller on. That's how important it is to him that Frank Miller really has a credit to this and feels like, all right, I finally gave up my baby for someone. I finally let someone do Sin City. Right. We're doing it the right way. So he knows he won't get screwed over like he Mm -hmm. felt he was uh, back in the Robocop days. So the look is a big component of that, of what won him over. Uh, Everyone says things look like Sin City because they're black and white, but there's clearly, I mean, it's about some of that monochrome stuff. It's about, uh, I mean, it's high exposure to eliminate the gradients between. It's very bright whites in the places it's white and very uh, dark blacks and obviously the opposite. But then you also have this uh, backlit lighting that they used to give all of the characters uh, almost an outline as if they're comic book characters, as if they're drawn. Mm -hmm. And that's something you really couldn't have even done with sets. It would have been such a nightmare to do with sets. But because they're shooting on green screens, you can essentially just have a bunch of lights hidden behind the characters and a green screen and then just paint everything out in post. Um, All the painting was done by, I believe, three different studios. All the matte painting and digital effects stuff. So that also the the score done by yes. three different people. Rodriguez did a lot of the Yellow Bastard stuff, but he also did stuff in the uh, other two segments as well. Just because he wanted each of them to have kind of a different feel, but still feel like they're overall the same thing. 
There's the selective color, which wasn't big in the first comic, but became used more in later comics. And that's something that people remember Sin City for. And maybe one of the more subtle ones, but definitely Frank Miller's drawing style, is the inverted black and whites. Um, so I noticed this shit all the time, but I, you could tell me if you noticed this. In the shadows, uh, when a character walks, uh, you can see it in the brick walls. In their shadows, rather than the bricks being black and the outline being white, you get the exact opposite of that. It doesn't make any sense in right. real life. But when Frank Miller is drawing these comics, he's drawing them with a black pen. That's his only uh-huh. fucking tool. So uh, he played around with a lot of shadows and, and uh, a lot of that stuff, and that's what made the comics really notable as far as a, as far as a style where the drawing is concerned. Mm. What maybe didn't come across, and the customer is always right, that definitely comes across in the rest of Sin City is that Robert Rodriguez is really good at making everyone look like a complete badass at all times. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, you're right. The first one, maybe not so much. But later, Although there's something kind of badass about uh, about the customer's always right. But later on, we get... we get I, Okay, so my favorite character is Dwight. Yeah. But partially that's because I have this really... I don't know why or where, but I have this bias toward Clive Owen sure. in every scenario. But Marv is Mickey Rourke, and he... So he looks weird. Anyway, <laughs> it looks like Marv from the comic. It's amazing how well. So a little experiment that comic book fans played around with when the movie first came out. Get yourself a copy of one of the stories and flip through it as the movie is happening. You will be it lines straight. You could fucking rip the pages off and tape them up against your TV. They're that close. And Marv looks just like he does in the mm-hmm. comic. It's amazing. Right. Well, and Hardigan looks like a badass. Yeah. All the women are sexy as hell, even yep. the little baby alligator girl. Right. Go back and listen to Super Beast or something. That's where I talk about baby alligators. But I'm not going to talk about that here because every girl in this movie is hot. Well, I have to give Rosario a little bit of credit. That moment at the end of the big fat kill where they all have the guns sure. and she has that evil fucking, yeah. it's evil, but it's also, they're, they're the good guys in mm-hmm. that scenario, I guess. I guess. Once again, everyone's a fucking criminal. Right. They're just trying to cover this up. But that look she gives is just so, she is just enjoying the cold-blooded mm-hmm. rain of bullets down into what's not the hot gates, by the right. way. And the the look she gives is just priceless. She looks like such a complete mm-hmm. badass. Sure. Well, and the other thing is that he gets all these actors, right? Rodriguez gets all these actors. So now it's we're in a whole different century than mm-hmm. this fucking show sure. came out. Sort of. And most of these actors kind of fizzled out. They disappeared, they yeah. They were huge when Sin City came out. We're talking about, okay, so Clive Owen, right. Mickey Rourke, Rosario Dawson, Brittany Murphy, uh, too soon, and... Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis. But all these actors now have all kind of gone. And then, so Elijah Wood, also in this film. And yeah. people will contest that he, I will say right now that Elijah Wood's career has fizzled out. People, there'll be two camps of people. Those that contest that Elijah Wood is still doing great. And when I say, what's he doing? They will respond, he was he was uh, Frodo Baggins. Yeah. To which I will say that was five years ago. What movie is that from? I exactly. believe is what you will say. And then the other group will contest that Elijah Wood never had a big career. And I'm leaning toward that group. I love Elijah Wood, but sure. I'm not under the illusion that he's a fantastically famous An actor. An A-list actor, right. And I think Mickey Rourke is one of the only, you know, that Rodriguez kind of brought his career back. Yeah. I mean, coming back with Sin City, you know, he'd been doing, I mean, he was in Once Upon a Time in Mexico. Yeah. Mickey Rourke has had so many revitalizations in his career. Yes. I don't know that anyone has ever made a comeback so many times as he has, but uh, he happens to be in the limelight a bit now, at least in comparison to the other actors who have all disappeared, or I mean, in comparison to when you look at what was going on at the sure. time. And one other actor who I think this is probably one of his best roles and fuck everybody that's shouting fear and loathing at their Zoom right oh, now, God. Uh, Benicio Del Toro is great in this film and he's right. an I believe he's an actor, right? Yes. I've I Although I haven't seen Wolfman, so people, I couldn't tell you. People tell me Benicio del Toro's an actor and that he does films and that he's critically acclaimed, but I haven't I've seen him seen in a anything. lot of yeah. films, okay? Yeah. Benicio del Toro is not in films. Yeah, it's weird. He's in 21 Grams. He's in 21 Grams. He's, he's in Traffic. In. Yeah. He's in Wolf. He's in these films that I look at and go I bet you that my mom likes that movie. It's weird. He's uh, one of those people who reminds me that no matter how many movies I see, there is a segment of movies that I am not even aware exists. Yeah. Uh, every once in a while, I'll show up at Facets and that'll happen. 
And there will be, oh, here's connections to these popular directors and all these, and I will not know one name anyone is talking about. Mm-hmm. And I feel like Benicio Del Toro kind of falls into a lot of that. He Sean must be Penn's making... another one. Yeah. People yeah, tell right, me Sean right. Penn's an actor. <laughs> yeah. And I've seen him in one or two films. Yeah, Love maybe... Sean Penn in the one or two films I've seen him right, in. Right, right. Love Benicio Del Toro But in these Sin guys City. are doing hundreds of movies and we yeah. haven't seen any of them. So I'm going to say right now that Benicio Del Toro's career fizzled out, but other people can probably that list is... 20 movies But the he truth will year. probably not hold yeah. up against that. So Rodriguez brings some actors back and some actors just disappear. And I will not attribute that to Rodriguez anything. Um, Rodriguez made Rose McGowan a thing for a while. I mean, he has yeah, some power to, yeah. Rose fucking McGowan became a person whose movies I watched. Well, I don't know if that was everyone. That might have just been you. Probably true. But I'm just saying he's really, really good at that. So among the talents, the scoring and the casting, uh, of course, the notoriously low budget. Um, keeping the budget of this thing low was part of the look of the film. Part of it is everything being green screened, but, uh, you know, that's a, we've never really talked about the Rodriguez CG. You can tell the CG apart from, let's say normal Hollywood CG. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I want to call it cheap, but part of it cheap. Yeah. What's wrong with cheap? I guess that's all right. Right. Yeah. It costs less money. What is it about the CG that looks so awesome and <laughs> so wrong at the same time? Well, I think the fact you that... You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, the when car. You see You're this talking in, about the car that goes into the water. Um, No, actually, I wasn't even thinking about oh, the car. okay. The car is also Tarantino's car. Uh, I don't know if we're, the red car is Tarantino's car. Oh, no, I'm talking... But I was thinking about... um That stuff pops up more for me sure. in Spy Kids. I noticed yeah. that a lot more. Yeah. Maybe because it's just... Cart- is it because it's cartoony? Is that yeah, what it well, is? Well, I think in this, it's weird because the stylization kind of allows for some of the CG to falter. Right. Sure. It's it's just placed well in it's placed well in the world that the film creates. Yeah, these may not be some of the most well-designed CG objects in the industry, but they do look and this is something that is almost unique to Rodriguez films. He gets this where nobody else does. They look like they're actually there. No matter how silly they are when Spy Kids and Spy Kids 2 when that fucking ride with the whirly thing takes yes. off in the beginning, you believe that it's there no matter how ridiculous <laughs> it looks. No matter how much it looks like that could not be a real item that sure. exists in physicality, you believe that it is actually taking off. And part of that is his method. This is somebody who swore off film school, puts down film school all the time. Completely it's something that we like, being people who like to put down college all the time. Uh-huh. But who swears off film school, wishes that people would not go to film school because he feels like that keeps you in a box. If you learn how to make films, then you know the uh, so-called proper way to make films, and then you make films their way. He's a guy who never learned how to properly make a film, and so that's why his films do a lot of weird stuff. That's why they get away with a lot of cheap stuff, because he kind of goes, well, how can I make this cheaply? And everyone around him who've worked on other projects say, wait, 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 that's that's not how that's usually done. But it doesn't matter, because it still gets the job done. You know, when you look at um, some of the CG he uses, he often has something very physical to help bring it into reality. Something like point of reference that he talks a lot about on the film schools for this, so I won't even bother going into that. But if you think about something like Once Upon a Time in Mexico, that opening scene where Selma Hayek throws the daggers and it kind of blows his hair back. I mean, that's a practical effect, the hair blowing back. But all the dad, all the dagger stuff is just CG, and you don't really think about it as CG because you focus on what the effect looks like is his hair blowing back. One from Sin City would be something like uh, Miho. Miho gets all the blood on her face. Uh, you know that there's some kind of trick in this because she does not flinch a bit. She doesn't close her eyes. It's kind of weird. Just we'll watch it, uh, you know, frame by frame, and it absolutely looks like a person has blood splattered on their face. No reaction to it at all. And that is just a combination of doing one take where she's standing there and another take where she has blood sprayed on her face and then just compositing them digitally. Whereas another film might do something like, oh, we can't throw blood on her face. That'll make her flinch. Let's just shoot her with no blood and then add CG blood on. Everyone looks at that and says, oh, that's that's CG CG blood. blood." Right. Right. Just little techniques like this. And they're littered throughout his films. And that's one of the things that makes him such an exciting filmmaker for me is that he's doing things in a way that other people just aren't doing. Well, so what else, if you're thinking special effects, stuff that doesn't really happen to the characters in Sin City? Uh, Taking away his weapons, probably. is. How do you forget a scene like that? 
So this was Grindhouse before Grindhouse existed. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were in that same fucking theater with me when this stuff was happening. People, the sounds that people were making was, and we were in, we were in what? A thing out in the suburbs, right? This wasn't, whoa, Music Box Massacre. This was like a bullshit AMC, AMC. (laughs) right? On, I think it was a Friday night or a Thursday at midnight. I mean, it's a midnight crowd, Uh but still, this isn't 24-hour movie marathon. And that crowd, the reaction from it was insane. I had never experienced anything like that up to that point. Something that I would later seek out and try and find when I got to Chicago. But that's one of those moments I always remember is, you know, at the end when he just has that fistful of yellow organs and the, just pulling him out of his body and the reaction from everybody, the kind of cringe, oh, but then there's sort of the applause. out. It actually got an applause yeah. in our theater. It was amazing. Wet chunks of bone into the floorboard. I mean, so relentless. Just this perfect combination of... Robert Rodriguez and Frank Miller coming together. I feel like Sin City, above all other things, was Robert Rodriguez's calling. Everything he had been doing up to this point, learning about the 3D stuff, making stuff on a low budget, Sin City would not exist if he hadn't. I previously said Sin City wouldn't exist without, Mm. I think, Spy Kids when we were talking about Uh shorts. But it would also not exist if he didn't know how to make things on the cheap. The studio went for it. He was able to make the thing on his own convince Frank Miller this is not a typical Hollywood story at all. And so finally, this property that may have never seen its way to cinemas Uh got there in this unconventional method. It's something that he was just fucking born to do. His skill set is so perfectly matched for it. I'm going to argue that that's not his calling, but I will say that I really like Sin City. (laughs) No, I understand where you're coming from. Uh, You're a big Planet Terror guy, I'm a huge Planet Terror guy. Yeah, no, Planet... I'm not even going to say that Sin City is his best film, but you cannot argue that the components aren't lining up here in a way that almost seems conspiratorial. If I'm going to pick what Robert Rodriguez's calling was so far in his career... It would be to do Grindhouse. To bring back the Grindhouse yeah, films. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Fingers crossed that that's happening. The one other thing that Sin City finally did that is extremely notable is this book versus the movie thing that had, we joke about it all the sure, fucking time. Right. That's double sleepy nap time, sleepy right? Nap time. I mean, we have a whole fucking gag about it because people always say so eye-rollingly that the book is better than the movie. And when comics came out, there will never be a faithful comic book adaptation These movies that should be getting hard R's are not, you know, even something like The Punisher, people said, not gritty enough, didn't capture the whatever. And it's hard because comic books usually encompass decades worth of material. They mean something different for everybody. And they get butchered in the movies. Mm -hmm. They're usually, let's just say that, right? I mean, come come on, that's true. They're usually bullshit. Absolutely true. They're awful. So what does Rodriguez do? Just for me, he creates this, this thing that was a thought experiment, but is now a real life experiment. He creates, hands down, fucking email me, but you will be dead wrong. So I'm just going to tell you that. The most faithful adaptation of all time. Right. The only way you would disagree is if you haven't actually read Sin City. Howard the Duck, man. I don't believe you just said that. Uh, Nancy doesn't have tits hanging out all over the place. And God, that's really the only thing I can think of. Off the- There's some small things, but frame by frame, you know, he shoots the frames just like the, even to the point that when there's a vertical frame, um, does that make sense, by the way, when I say vertical? I know I'm making a gesture yeah, to you. No, I gotcha. A frame that is taller than it is uh-huh. longer. Rectangular on the he, tall side. He will shoot the scene from the feet up so that he actually captures everything that was in the frame in the comic. So he's adding motion, but only in a way that restores what Frank Miller wrote on the page, puts that into the screen without actually changing it, yeah. without pulling back and showing a wider shot with more material that Frank Miller didn't actually create. He's doing scenes, you know, from toe to head. So this is panel for panel and uh, to the point where this is just amazing, too. There is no screenwriting credit on Sin City. No one made the adaptation because one didn't exist. If you will watch the credits, you will see Frank Miller wrote Sin City. It is Frank Miller Sin City. That is it. That's the writing credit on the you know, Robert Rodriguez's credits are just as enjoyable as sure. his movies. Robert He's, Rodriguez and John Carpenter are some of my favorite credits to watch. Oh, I, yeah, that's true of the John Carpenter stuff. You know, Rodriguez even uh, gets a credit in his movies as the cook. Chef to Mr. Rodriguez is always Robert Rodriguez. So he's having fun with these credits, but in a way that also embodies what he was trying to do. He was trying to make a translation so it doesn't have a translator because that's what he did as the director. That's what he did putting the project together. That's what the producers did. 
The screenwriter was Frank Miller when he wrote the fucking comic because that's all that was needed. So if I haven't made my case for the notability of Sin City, no one will ever make one, ever, except maybe the man himself. Go and listen to some of the stuff. Robert Rodriguez, the director commentary, the features uh, on the DVD stuff. He did a South by Southwest thing on um, Planet Terror on the Grindhouse stuff that was pretty cool. But go look up and find some of that stuff. And Quentin Tarantino talking. You really have to see these men talking yeah. to understand. That's really all this. This is this. Uh, unfortunately, what we couldn't do for this episode, which would have made it, back. which would have made it a forty-minute episode instead of a, I don't know, kill a nine style, hours. Yeah, I don't know what's going on here. Is we just should have we should have replaced ourselves with Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez as guest hosts. Year four, man. Year four. Uh, we have a website, Double Feature Show at Gmail dot com, a Tarantino Rodriguez inspired website. And we have a less Tarantino and Rodriguez inspired email address where you can send me an email about, they can email Michael what's in the briefcase, right? No. You would love to get no. those emails. So Michael has desperately been trying to figure out what's in the briefcase, Fuck guys. You. So if you could just send him an email have, about that. that I don't be care what's in the briefcase. Double feature show. I forgot there's a briefcase at in that gmail. Dot, You know, the original intention was to put diamonds in the briefcase. I don't want to know what's in the briefcase. <laughs> Anyways. What uh, What's coming up on the show next time? Next time, we're going to do Robert Rodriguez and Quentin Tarantino back to I think wait, we're going to shove one more in this year. Oh, okay. So we've done plenty of that. So we probably won't get to that until like... I think we'll get to one more. But other than that, we're doing two other films. Catfish and the Girlfriend Experience. Great. Watch more fucking film. Bye.